Book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 1 to 19. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. <coughs> Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. To what can I compare this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, he is a glutton and a drunkard. A friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Matthew chapter 11 verses 1 to 19 Hope When life is hard Well, good morning My prayer is that This morning as we meet together With the Lord in his word uh, We would see something of Jesus And his compassion Particularly when life is hard. What is it called in a movie when something unexpected happens? I, th I think they call it a plot twist, don't they? It's a, it's a literary technique that introduces some sort of change in direction or expected outcome of the plot in a story or a movie. The guys are going to put a picture on the screen. I don't know if any of you have seen that or remember the words that go along with that scene in that movie. Perhaps you can remember a story or a film that had an unexpected ending. Well, we'll see something like that uh, in the account before us this morning. For John the Baptist, things are not turning out as he had expected. And so as we begin this morning, I have a question for you. What should you do when your expectations about God in your life are not met? We'll come back to that question a little bit later on. But first, let me give you some background to the text that we're looking at this morning. We've arrived at Matthew chapter 11. And as we've seen during this series in this gospel, Matthew wants his readers to see who Jesus is. He's the one who fulfills all of the Old Testament promises. Jesus is the long-awaited King, the Messiah. And the king invites people to follow him. But that won't be easy 
In fact, last week in chapter 10 and verse 38, we read these challenging words. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Following Jesus may be really hard. It was for John. We get to chapter 11 and Matthew has told us about the things that Jesus has been teaching. The things that Jesus has been doing. Those miraculous works of healing the sick. Blind people receiving their sight. And in this next section we see how people will respond to Jesus. Notice as we look at verses 1 to 19, three things. Firstly, John's question, verses 2 to 6. Then John's commendation, verses 7 to 11. And then thirdly, John's example, verses 11 to 19. So first, John's question. Matthew summarizes what Jesus has been doing. Look down at verse 1. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and to preach in their cities. Now, if we were to look back at chapter 10 and verse 5 and chapter 9 and verse 35, you would see that Jesus was calling and teaching and training his disciples And then he was preaching the good news to large crowds. John, however, is in prison. And he hears what the Messiah, what the Christ has been doing. And he thinks, what's happening? Have I missed something? He's wondering why things are not working out as he had expected. You know, hardship and suffering have a way of revealing our expectations. Perhaps what we hoped for doesn't come true. Or even worse, maybe our nightmares come true. And sometimes you think, Jesus, I'm trying to follow you. But my life just seems to be getting harder. That's what's happening to John. Back in chapter 3, you see, when John points out Jesus as the one, he quotes the prophets and he has an expectation of what the Messiah would do. He would bring with him judgment. Look with me, if you would, at Matthew chapter 3 and verse 4. It says, John wore a garment of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when John saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come into his place of baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce then in keep it, uh, fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe lies ready at the root of the tree. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me, there will come one more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It's a bit intense, isn't it? Coming wrath, burning up chaff. For John, that is not what Jesus seems to be doing. John had heard reports. Look at verse 2. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, 
he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we look for another? John has his doubts. I wonder what report specifically uh, went back to John. If you flip back a page to chapter 9 and verse 11, we read this. After the Pharisees had seen who Jesus had been mixing with, they have a question. And they say to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And then in verse 14 of the same chapter, we see John's disciples again. They come to Jesus and they say, why do we and the Pharisees fast? But your disciples, they don't fast. Jesus wasn't meeting John's expectations of what a Messiah should be like. I'm rotting here in prison. And what's Jesus doing? He's having dinner with tax collectors and sinners. So back to my opening question. What do you do when life is not turning out as you had expected? When God is not showing up in your situation in ways that you would like him to. What do you do when you you just can't see how God is working or what he's doing in the situations and circumstances of life? Perhaps what you'd hope for uh, in life is not how things are turning out. So how should we respond Do we just need to become a little bit more stoic? I don't think so. What did John do? He had questions and he took them to Jesus. Now he couldn't go himself because he he was in prison. But he sends his disciples and they ask his question. And as we'll see, John, well he gets an answer, but at least an answer in part, if not a full answer. I want to say this morning, when we go to God with our prayers, we don't always get answers, do we? But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't go to the Lord with our questions. In fact, that's exactly what we need to do. Go to Jesus with your questions. Talk to him, spend time with him. Share humbly how you feel. Life sometimes feels unbearably hard. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, one day, You probably will. We have heartaches and disappointments, pain and sorrow over many, many things. Problems with family, problems with finances, frustrations and failure. Unanswered prayer, issues with relationships. We live, don't we, in a broken world and we are broken people. There's sickness and sadness and real sorrow in our world. And as Christians, we're not immune from these things. In this world, we will have trouble. And therefore, sometimes we have expectations that will go unmet. And in those times, we need to go to the Lord and tell him. It's okay to talk with him about all of it. Do you know that the most common type of psalm in the Bible is known as lament? They express deep sorrow, even complaint, and request for help. And the thing about it is, the Psalms of Lament are directed to the Lord. So can I encourage you this morning, wherever you're at, whatever your situation, go to him and pour out your heart. Life is hard, friends, and it was really, really hard for John. In just three chapters, he'll lose his life. And as Jesus followers, we follow a crucified saviour. And as we know, sometimes he doesn't deliver us from trials, but rather through them. I'm going to get to what Jesus says to John in a moment. But what John doesn't grasp yet is that at this point in time, Jesus has not come to bring judgment but to bear it. 
before we move on, we don't have time to look up all these references, but you can jot them down. Maybe take a look later. Chapter 8, verse 3. Chapter 8, verse 27. Chapter 8, verse 28. Chapter 9, verse 2. Chapter 9, verse 25 and verse 27. Matthew wants us to see in those verses what Jesus is doing. And what does he say to John? Look at verse 4 and verse 5. And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. The poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who's not offended or scandalized by me. Essentially, he tells John all of the things that Matthew has shown us in chapters 8, 9, and 10 about what Jesus was doing. Healing the sick, calling disciples, preaching the gospel. And he reminds John that that is exactly what the Messiah had come to do. And he quotes Isaiah. I'll just quote a couple of the verses, but there are four quotations from Isaiah that Jesus melds together in what he tells John. Isaiah 35, verse 5. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Isaiah 61 and verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. John, you know the scriptures. You know the scroll of Isaiah. I'm doing the things the Messiah came to do. I bumped into Lynn the other day. I was coming out of the post office and I wasn't looking where I was going. I was on my phone looking down and I bumped into her and um, she told me a little bit about her operation and how brilliant it was to be able to see. She had the operation on her eye and she said, it's just fantastic to be able to see. She said, I've been praying for the person or the family of the person who gave me this piece that they've put in my, my eye. She was so grateful that she was able to see. I want to ask you this morning, can you see who Jesus is? Sometimes it's hard, isn't it? Particularly when life is difficult. John is thinking, yes, Jesus, I know all that. But what about the judgment? Where and when is the judgment and the justice coming? When will you deal with Herod? Who'd put John in prison? When will you deal with the hypocritical religious leaders and the Roman invaders? When will you liberate the captives? When do I get to be set free? You see, John didn't know how the Lord would accomplish these things. I'm not sure that he could see that King Jesus was also the suffering servant of Isaiah. He would liberate people by bearing the just punishment for their sins. Judgment is coming, John. And we see justice and love, don't we, at the cross as Jesus takes the place of sinners. I wonder if you see that this morning. He is the one who came to give life for sinful people like you and me. Will we come to him and believe that he can forgive the wrong that we have done because he took our place and paid the price with his death for us? 2 Corinthians 5 reminds us, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God.
And if you're a believer this morning, I don't know what you're going through. I do know that life can be painful and difficult. And while I don't know why he allows specific things to come into our lives, I do know this. It's not because he doesn't love us. John 15 verse 12 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. If he would do that for you, you can trust him, even when it's hard. Whatever prison you might find yourself in, Jesus has not forgotten about you. He loves you. Second, I want you to notice what Jesus says about John. John's commendation, more than a prophet, verses 7 to 11. How does Jesus respond to John's concerns? Does he rebuke him? Look at verse 7. No, I don't think so. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed? Shaken by the wind, what then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. And I tell you, more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Wow, what a commendation. Verse 11, amongst those born of women. That's a fairly comprehensive list. John is the greatest. Why? Well, Jesus says John is no pushover. He doesn't wear fancy clothes like those in king's palaces. No doubt a, a dig at King Herod who'd had John imprisoned. No. When people went out into the desert to see John and to hear him preach, it was like listening to one of the Old Testament prophets. In fact, verse 14, he was like Elijah. But John was not just any prophet. He was the prophet that the other prophets pointed to. Malachi chapter 3, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. John was great because he was the last in a line of prophets pointing to the coming one. John could say, this is the one. It's Jesus. This is him. Now, John may have his doubts right now, but do you remember how John pointed out Jesus? Chapter 1 and verse 29 of John's gospel says this. The next day, John the Baptist, he saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, behold or look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John pointed people to Jesus. Well, listen to this, and this is just brilliant. Listen to this. Again, John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 40. This is what was said about John the Baptist. He, that is Jesus, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign. But everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. Isn't that brilliant? John didn't get to see everything that Jesus would go on to do. But he made an impact in people's lives by pointing them to Jesus. So thirdly and finally, John's example to point people to Jesus. I wonder whether you got up this morning and looked in the mirror and thought, I'm greater than Moses. <laughs> no? 
Uh, that's how, how uh, one preacher opened his sermon on this passage. You see, if John was greater than all who went before him, that would include Abraham and Moses and David and Isaiah. And if the one who was least in the kingdom of heaven was greater than John, well, that must mean you are greater than Moses in some sense. Let's read what it says in verse 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. God, he is. Listen. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children singing in the marketplace to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. We'll come back to verse 11 in just a minute. Verses 12 to 15 have had a lot written about them. But I think what Jesus is saying is that since his arrival, there has been real opposition to God's kingdom. And we know that, don't we, from the Gospels. We could mention the, the tragic killing of the, the children, the babies under the age of two by King Herod, trying to get rid of Jesus. All of that demonic activity that surrounded Jesus' ministry. Then there was the time when they tried to seize him after he'd been preaching in the synagogue. He'd read the scroll of Isaiah and they wanted to throw him off a cliff. John is put into prison. Soon he'll lose his head. And eventually, through the betrayal of Judas, Jesus the king will be taken, just as he said in the parable. And he'll be killed. He'll be crucified. Jesus is telling the people to listen, but they don't want to. They want to get rid of him. They refuse to see and to listen. Verses 16 to 19, like pretentious, grumpy children. Not childlike, if only they'd been humble and childlike. No, rather they're childish. They don't want anything to do with Jesus. They say that John has a demon. And Jesus, they say, well, he's a drunk and he hangs out with the wrong sorts of people. And you know, you, you can't win with these sorts of people. Uh, they would reject Jesus no matter what. John leads this trimmed back lifestyle. He doesn't eat like everybody else. He doesn't dress like everybody else, unless your name, name's Elijah. He dressed a bit like Elijah. He eats a strange diet, and what do they say about him? He's weird. He's got a demon. And Jesus, well, he eats and drinks with his disciples and with sinners. And what do they say about him? A glutton and a drunkard. Which may, well, just be a, a, a reference back to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Uh, instructions on how to deal with a rebellious son. They want to kill Jesus. They don't want God on God's terms. They don't want to see him as he really is. Well, God is good, isn't he? And we need to trust him even when times are hard and we don't understand. Wisdom is foolishness to the world. And yet Jesus is God's wisdom. And verse 19 says that wisdom is justified by her deeds. Jesus will go on to die for sinners. And for some... The idea of a dead Messiah equals a failed Messiah, but not to God. His wisdom is perfect. And Jesus' death makes a way possible for us to know forgiveness, to be welcomed into God's family, and to have eternal life. And that starts when we trust 
in the Lord Jesus. As we close, let's just briefly go back for a minute to verse 11. Yet there is one who is least, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. How? How are we greater? Well, John was great because he could point out Jesus and he could point people to Jesus. But as we've said, John didn't know everything that would happen. John didn't get to see Jesus' death and his resurrection. He was the greatest under the old covenant. But you, believer, even if you are the least in the kingdom, you have Jesus' righteousness. You have his spirit within you. We don't realize quite how precious that is. We see more of the story. We know about the cross and the resurrection. And you get this incredible privilege to live in these days after the cross and the responsibility to tell people about Jesus' love for them. Can I ask you this morning, how's that going for you? How are you getting on with that? When we become Christians, our lives don't get easier, do they? In lots of ways, they become harder. We remember what the Apostle Paul said. All those who live or desire to live godly lives will suffer persecution. Our expectation as those who follow a crucified saviour should be that life is going to be tough but he has promised to be with you he's gone before us and there is nothing that we can go through that he doesn't understand so take heart this morning if life is tough don carson wrote a book about suffering in the christian life it was called how long lord and in it he says this Frequently, it is when we are crushed and devastated that the cross speaks most powerfully to us. The wounds of Christ then become Christ's credentials. The world mocks, but we are assured of God's love by Christ's wounds. Now, I know I've quoted it before, but it is a favorite, so you will forgive me. I love the poem by Edward Shilletu. Uh, he was in World War I, he was a soldier. He saw terrible, terrible things. And he wrote this poem entitled, We Must Have Thee, O Jesus of the Scars. The last verse says this, The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds but thou alone. It's always good to reflect, isn't it, on God's word and how we should respond to it. This morning we've seen that life is often hard for those who follow Jesus. And we need to think about, as we close, how can we bring our future hope into the present? I asked Karen, how do you do that? And she said, by reminding myself what, of what God has said. So can I do that for you this morning as we close? In Isaiah 46 and verse 4, we read these precious, precious words. This is God speaking. And he says this. Even to your old age, I will be the same. Even in your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it. And I will carry you. I will bear you and I will deliver you. Shall we pray together? Father, we want to thank you for Jesus. We want to thank you that there is no experience that we can go through 
that he doesn't understand. We want to thank you that he cares for each and every head bowed. We thank you that he demonstrated his love by dying for us. We pray that you would help us to trust you, particularly in dark days and difficult days. Help us, Lord, to be kind and sensitive to one another, that we might support one another, pray for one another, encourage one another in difficult days. And fill us with that future hope that one day, Every tear will be wiped away. There will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, and no more sin. And we will be forever with the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want to